What is brown, hairy, and wears sunglasses? A coconut on vacation. How does Darth Vader like his toast? On the dark side. Guys, this is your weekly reminder that I hope solidifies through the episodes to lighten up and live. You only get one chance at the day, and don't take it too serious. Dory 1, this is Fire Team Delta. Dad's coming home. Welcome to the Military Veteran Dad Podcast, where it is our mission to bring every dad home. I am your host, Ben Colloy. I'm a United States Marine veteran, husband, and a father. We will bring authentic conversations to inspire action in your life so we can close the gap between the dad you are today and the dad you want to be tomorrow. This is the Military Veteran Dad Podcast. Hey guys, welcome back to Military Veteran Dad. This is episode 129 and I'm your host, Ben Colloy. I hope you had an amazing 4th of July week and you got some great family time in, great memories, great time and opportunity just to reconnect, pause, and enjoy kind of that halfway point through the year, halfway through summer, halfway through the year, take reflection on what you've accomplished so far in this year. And again, I appreciate you for showing up on this podcast because I know you have many, many choices where you can invest your time and resources and you have chosen to invest your time here listening to this podcast. So I appreciate you as a listener. If this is your first time, welcome. If you're a longtime listener from the bottom of my heart, I absolutely appreciate everything that you do to help support and grow this podcast. And if you have not headed over to iTunes and left an iTunes review, those mean the world to me. They help the podcast grow. They help add credibility to this podcast and the content that we deliver each week to help bring you home and a better dad each week. Today's guest is Jordan Hillstrom, and he's got a story that every dad needs to hear because it's one of humbleness, it's one of empathy, it's one of kind of refiguring out how it's supposed to work and then really applying it and making it show up in his life every single day. It's just a great human being, great father, and a great story from the beginning in his military service in the Army to where he is now and what he's doing and how he's showing up for his kids. So without further ado, let's get started with Jordan Hillstrom. And if you want to hear my big takeaway, hang on to the other side. Welcome to the podcast, Jordan. Hey, thanks for having me. We've been connected for a while and we connected, I think, way back like mid-summer, late fall. And then we talked again this recently and we decided to get you in the podcast. So tell us a little bit about your transition, your military life and what you're up to today. Yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah, I think you reached out via Facebook, or I forget how the connection came, maybe LinkedIn, but I, I loved what you were doing. And I think because I have my own podcast that kind of serves somewhat of the same you know, demographic, if you will, I, I feel like we're on parallel paths trying to serve a greater mission other than ourselves. You know, I served with 2nd Ranger Battalion. Um, post-military, I went and spent uh, about five and a half years as a law enforcement officer. Um, and now currently in my current role is I'm a, I'm a business, I'm a partner with a software development company with a couple of my brothers and my father. So kind of huge change from military to, to now, uh, but it's been a phenomenal change. And the impact that, you know, I, the military had on me is, has been, has been hard. There's been a lot of transitional points in my life, but where I'm at today is I'm a lot healthier version of myself um, than, than I was even five years ago. But a large degree of that has to come with guys like you that are helping shape who I am today, um, instead of being a victim for my past in a sense. So I got a question. I'm always curious when people take an alternative path than the one that TAPS assigns you when you transition out of the military, who helped you understand that there's more than one road in life and you don't have to take the common road? How to answer that? I don't know. But I guess one thing I'll say is every opportunity in the military I had to go to different military school, I realized that it didn't ever tell me I have to go one direction, but what it did do is give me tools for my kit bag. So every time a new opportunity came up, I'm like, okay, I have a new thing. I have to new mission. What tools do I have to be successful in this mission? So I think part of that just came from military and just learning how to be very adaptive. Um, and, and maybe in my childhood, I worked on a farm growing up, you know, dairy farm and to, to be a successful farmer, you have limited means, but you have a lot of opportunity to solve problems. So you have to be creative. So I watched the people I worked around on that farm, always finding a way to get things done. There was never an excuse. It was always, hey, X problem, this is a solution. Jerry rigging, the, the, the term comes for a reason, like you have to figure out life. So I think that, that was a big backdrop of, of how I operate today in that transition or different paths in life. 
I don't think I knew that you were raised on a dairy farm because I was raised on a cattle and pig farm when I grew up. And so I had some of the same, my, my dad's called Dr. Dan because everybody brings their broken stuff to fix it. He's like one of the only guys that can weld within like 10 mile radius and they always bring everything to, to get him welding it. And so I had the same, like he can fix anything, but I didn't figure out what you figured out. And I want to dive into that word opportunity because I think this is a word that honestly, I didn't even have in my vocabulary really until like 10 years after getting out of the military. So did you have, like, was there like an, an area where you realized opportunity was some new word that you could create out of nothing? Or was it kind of just like you naturally had the vision of putting like opportunity is actually how you can like create a life that doesn't exist, like out of thin air almost. So I think we all have our, our God-given skill sets. And I think I'm an idea guy. So I walk into an opportunity, you know, and I'm, I'm not seeing what I see in the physical. I'm saying, how can I make this better? Um, you know, I have products that I've helped invent now that they weren't in existence when I, when I invented them. So now I have a team obviously with me, but I've always seen things a little bit different. Like in school, you know, subject being taught, whether it's math or whatever, I would ask questions that were outside the norm. And I was kind of like, I've got this, you know, you're just a rebel rouser. You like to rock the boat, right? That's been my personality since like birth, I guess. And then coupled with the fact that I'm one of 16 kids, I'm always, I was always kind of searching for um, affection, searching for attention. And, and I think it came from that as opportunity is that just to, to survive in life as a young kid. Um, and I had a great upbringing. My parents were phenomenal and um, there were no complaints there, but just a lot of challenges that were presented from a young age, just because there's so many kids. I feel like I'm like talking to my doppelganger because I am also like, I consider an idea guy. I was also the guy that always asked questions. I was the guy in college class that raised my hand five minutes before the end of the class where all the other young kids wanted to get out. I was like, I'm paying this guy to answer these questions. It's calculus. Yeah. I don't understand it. I'm going to raise my, qu my hand and ask a better question so I can understand what he's talking about. And I was always that guy, but I couldn't figure out how to apply it. Like I always felt like left out. Like that was a feeling that I never feel like I could fit in. And I couldn't, I didn't have a 16. I only had three, I had two sisters and I was in the middle. So I had my middle child syndrome a little bit. It was probably the only thing I had, but 16, I could definitely <laughs> see how that created pressure that to survive, you really needed to learn to meet your own needs in a lot of different ways, learn how to create what you needed in front of you. Cause two people cannot provide everything for 16 kids. And they can provide the basics, but you still have to learn how to do that basic part. So I can definitely see how that folded into your story. Yeah, hundred percent. And one thing that, you know, in the last few years, I've been following, you know, guys like Simon Sinek and, you know, like starting with the question, why? So every opportunity you walk into, you know, if let's say you're in the military or you're working a civilian job now and the boss says, Hey, go shovel that ditch. I'm going to get pissed. But if he says, Hey, if, if if we have to, you know, there's gold in this, in these grounds somewhere, we have to dig this trench because at some point we're going to find the gold that we need to survive. Like I'm going to be like, awesome. Let's go dig the ditch. But if you just tell me to dig a ditch, I'm going to get pissed. So for me to make me like be really driven to do something, I want to know the why behind the scenes. Like, why are we doing this? And it's not because I disrespect you and your position. It's because that that's how I'm wired. So I think that, that backdrop and that um, foundation of who I am really creates the opportunity then everything I see is not just a problem. It's, and that's a cliche saying, sure, but it truly is to me, it's an opportunity. So every stressor, every problem, I just view differently. Again, you just like, you're solidifying more and more like you're my doppelganger, uh, or I'm your doppelganger, whichever way you want to look at it, because that what you're talking about there. And I can also see in your story, how the Ranger actually probably like increase the temperature on your life to really figure out what, all that was meant for and like what could really come out if you really squeeze the orange was it orange juice and what you could do with it. And that that gave you that confidence to actually do something with the big ideas. Cause that was something I had problems with. I had always great ideas, but they just stayed ideas. And I was always too afraid to take action on them because I just never felt like I was confident. I never felt confident in high school, never felt really confident in the Marine Corps. I felt like I was waiting to get found out. And even when I got out, like it was just this idea of not being able to understand how I could provide what I needed to do or what I felt like I was called to do. And it was kind of this, this weird programming that I had to figure out on my own, but it took me almost, like I said, 10 to 14 years to really figure it out, going to college, dropping out of college, figuring it out through leadership and just figuring out kind of rebooting my life from the, the, go, the, the, the base code up of what it really took to live my life in the way that I wanted to. Sure. No, you make some good points. You know what? 
life is simple in, in a lot of regards. We overcomplicate things and you look at it like most adults walk around and they put these face, these facades on. Most people have hurts. They have these identity crisis issues they don't know how to deal with, but we, we don't want to talk about it. It's taboo. But then you go back and you rewire like 20 years ago, like what caused that adult to be the way they are? So if they're angry, they're, they're hurt, like hurting other people, all that kind of stuff, usually stemming from something in their childhood. And that's one thing I refuse to let my childhood, my early adult, you know, military transition time, like all that stuff, I refuse to let it affect, you know, my future and going back to my childhood. And then what made me successful as a ranger, even, you know, I was, you know, at the, my zenith of height, I was probably five, seven soaking wet. Um, and growing up, my older brother was, I was, you know, way taller, way stronger, you know, a lot smarter and cried by teachers in school. Like, man, why can't you be more like your brother? Why can't you be smarter like your brother? Um, you know, in sports then, man, you're, you're a little bit shorter than your brother, a little bit weaker than your brother. And, and maybe it wasn't verbalized, but there was actions that were in place that were, you know, solidifying. Yeah, re- exactly. Um, and so in the military then, and, you know, being a Finnish descent, uh, there's this thing called, we sit, it's called Sisu. It's uh, this, this intestinal fortitude that you will not quit. Like I will, I will die before I quit. Right. So then take all that. And then when you, when I went through, it's called the Ranger indoctrination program. You know, we probably flunked, flunked out like 50, 60 of the, of the cadets going through or the, the um, Ranger students uh, through that program. And I think one of the drivers that kept me going was because my entire life, I was told I'm not good enough. And that was like the feel I needed. And that was, is what it took. Um, and ultimately it really drove me then it propelled me into being successful in that, in that unit. So to really bring home whether you are my true doppelganger, what about the word believe? Was that something you had to internally believe you were capable of more than the words that people assigned you? Yeah. I mean, for a long time, I actually ran away when I was, I was just talking to some friends. I ran away when I was 16. I was, I was, a lot of it was environmental factors that were going on for my family for a bit. Um, but I think big picture is I was, I was really struggling with an identity. And so that was kind of the point in my life. I realized I, I had to take ownership of that, even at 16, that ultimately it's up to me to choose who I'm going to be and what, what voices I'll allow into my life. And I wish like every veteran could hear that in transition because often, especially depending on how your military service transfolded, there are so many words that were either assigned by a staff NCO or an officer that just kind of be cemented into your conscience of who you are. And then we just operate on these ideas. Well, this must, must be true because people have been telling me all my life. And who am I to argue with what people have been telling me all my life? And then we just believe it. And then we just keep our life flatlined for that type of period. And, and I wish, like, I, like I'm hearing what you're saying, and I know that there's veterans out there that get stuck in changing the language of what they hear in their head from that voice and those words. And as a parent, I know that the words that I use with my kids become the inner self-critic that they use on themselves in the future. So it's super, super critical to one, make sure you're cognizant as a dad, but then understanding what critical behavior you have in your head, because it's just going to get passed down from generation to generation, except it's not the kind of legacy you want to pass down like an heirloom or something. Oh, 100% agreed. And that's one thing, you know, a lot of our generation kind of gets crap for being weak and mamby pamby. Uh, but you stop and think about this. When you say things flippantly, like to your kid does something stupid, like, are you an idiot? Like, you don't mean that truly. But what, what does he take out of that, that dialogue, right? He takes on that he's an idiot. And so you reinforce a bad behavior. You know, when I was in the military, I remember my first shoot house, I was a, a young ranger, private, and we, we jacked it up, but you're supposed to, like you're a brand new private, you're supposed to screw things up. And I remember the the words that he used were so demeaning. So like they, they were, they killed your spirit. It made me fearful to go into a shoot house for like six months, probably forever. I was always a little bit hesitant to go in because he didn't lift me up. Didn't, didn't give me encouragement. He tore me down. And, it, and it, most military guys wouldn't typically admit to this, but it was so affecting me and my career. It actually left like a doubt in my mind of like, will I ever be good enough to, to make this, this unit? And obviously I did multiple deployments and, and it was fun and had a lot of good times, but there's always something in the back of my mind of like, I may screw up. I may get this guy killed. And that's always going to be there because that's a, a lot of pressure you're dealing with. It's a high risk job. And, and with that comes a lot more risk, right? So we don't need to add to that as leaders and, or as fathers. Now, like, what are we doing to lift our kids up, to lift our community up? What words are we using? Cause they, they have the power of life and death in them. I truly believe that. 
I appreciate what you're sharing. And there's a story that I don't think I've ever shared this in the podcast, but it was in the infantry training that every Marine has to go through after boot camp up at Camp Pendleton. And there is an up, he sees me, I'm down exercise with live ammunition where you're firing down range at targets. And it was the first time we really had ever done anything like this. And I remember being overwhelmed, feeling just kind of anxious and feeling like I was going to mess it up and mess up the routine of reloading my ammunition. And then I was starting to get yelled at through this because I, I must have been me messing something up that someone came over and started yelling at me. And to this day, I still feel like, you know what, that was just the universe telling me I was an idiot and I couldn't even fire <laughs> rounds down range straight while running towards straight at this without a real enemy around me. Like, what the hell am I doing being a Marine if I can't even put a round down range while we're actually just doing a practice exercise? It, it is. It's so interesting to see like the dynamics. And, and I think because so many leaders have been trained incorrectly, even to today, like if, if they don't know how to effectively train individuals and they're not actually good leaders, they're just promoted because kind of the system they're in. If they don't understand the words they use to empower people, even if you screw up, there's a way to actually encourage good behavior. You know, think about a dog. I know it doesn't happen near as much anymore, but the saying of like, you know, you beat a dog with newspaper for doing something bad you don't get the desired result you actually want by beating it with newspaper. If you want good results, you need to create pathways that are positive. So he does something good. You encourage that behavior continually over time. You get the desired results. So you chastise, you, you, you know, belittle, you, you give harsh words. You don't end up getting the desired result you want. You reinforce to where he's always never good enough or she's never good enough. Right. I love what you just said there. And we just got a dog yesterday. So this is brand new for me. And it's our second family dog. And I know going in that I was like, we're not going to, it's more about training us than it is about training the dog. So I'm looking at, we're getting a dog trainer next week to come in to make sure we understand the proper habits and they understand the proper protocol. Because just like in parenting, we don't gifted all the answers to the, oh, there's no owner's manual when these things come out screaming at you. But you, and this is where we all usually mess up. We think that we have to figure it out all our own. But it's not. We can use a resource like the podcast like this. That's why it exists to understand and get information from other dads that have figured it out and that are ahead of us. But it's those little steps. It's not a big step. It's those little steps where you realize that the pattern of what I'm doing is actually just passing it on. And two weeks ago, I had an interview with Virginia Cruz, and she talked about moral injury, which I think is something else that can be exacerbated by a bad commander who is using their position of authority to abuse it, either to go past the wire, as she talked about going out the wire, just so they can increase the risk so that he can get his cob. And that way he can go home with his ribbon. Meanwhile, he's risking the lives of everyone with him. And what that actually does, the people that he's leaving, that he's leading, and then they have to go back home and go back to normal, that that moral injury just corrupts that your ability to understand what's right and wrong. And what you just highlighted, when you get what's wrong and right with yourself wrong, like that's where the dark shit starts coming. Like that's where you can get the thoughts of like, well, maybe I should just off myself because maybe you have a few of those universal moments where that was the universe telling me I officially suck as a human being and I should do something about it. No, I mean, I, and I did listen to that podcast and I think there's some insight I took. And, and one thing I'm fighting back against some of this um, stigma that we're creating actually by our culture is you live in this camp, you're diagnosed with PTSD and and, you know, like uh, Bush Jr. mentioned at some some speaking engagement that my brother was at that I kind of learned vicariously is all personnel that were in combat have post-traumatic stress. Like you get in a car crash, like I'm not saying you have a disorder, but there's stress involved, right? It's after an event. I got PTSD from homeschooling kids during corona. Dude, dude, from this morning I had PTSD, <laughs> yeah. man. Those kids are terrors, dude. So at the end of the day, we put this stigma and we put this weight of this diagnosis of Oh, you have PTSD. Now you're going to live in this camp forever. Like, Hey, welcome to the club. You're never leaving. So what if, what if we said, Hey, we have post-traumatic stress. There's symptoms that come up. You've been rehardwired. Like you join the military. And I, you know, the idea of billions of years of, of training the, the mind that we're not supposed to kill each other. Then, then you go in there, kill, 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 cold blue steel, like all these things shooting at targets that look like men, then going into other training scenarios, shoot houses with real images of the people. Then you're going into combat. And, and, you know, a lot of people had to essentially take others' lives and it does warp some of your mentality. But what if we had this mentality in life that, hey, that doesn't identify who we are. That's just a symptom of things we've gone through. And but let's not live here. Let's just identify that there's some things we have to work on. And it's a process. It's a life. But you don't ever stay in this camp forever. Because that's where I fear a lot of veterans are, are becoming an, an enabled for this cycle where I'm, 
I'm got PTSD and, and um, the, the VA screwing me, man. I couldn't get my appointment for six months. And the you victim know, mindset where it's not my problem that I'm stuck here. It's I'm waiting for someone to come by and, and save me. hundred percent. And then you have to bro that mentality and I'm not knocking them completely, but the, you know, the nine lines and the ranger ups and like, there's some fun stuff that comes with that, but it's given these people a false identity. Like once you get out of the military, like you're a dad and you're a corporate businessman or you're, you're a medic or like whatever that is, it's awesome. But realize that when you're wearing the 5'11 pants and these shirts and this, you act like you're, you know, the quarterback that's always kind of wearing the letterman 20 years later, like you have to move on. You have to realize that you're a new person now and take that. Don't, don't like throw it all out and act like it's garbage. Take those tools that you gained and put them on your tool back and tool belt and, and live out of that posture, but don't be enabled by this victim mentality. And you talked about it in the beginning when you talked about the Rangers giving you these tools and allowing you to recreate your life to where you are now. And you also hinted something that I hopefully say every podcast because I wanted to hit home is that most veterans get stuck in the legacy of our service instead of switching to the legacy of our family. Because once your service is over, you're just a number in the archive and no one really remembers you. And trying to focus and figure out what that meant is just wasting your time and energy and you're missing some of the most important moments in your life going forward and they're right there in front of you and they don't require you to have these big answers they just require you to show up and have fun and play and play trains or whatever age your kids are at like it's often which is simpler than we think but just getting stuck on what the past meant is often like biggest hang up where i see many military dads just getting stuck in that transition process you know, a few years ago, because my wife and I were foster parents and we ended up adopting our two boys now. And um, I remember being at the zoo one day and I mean, it's a zoo, but but the point the point being, that I was at the zoo, we were seeing the animals, but I wasn't there. I was checked out. I was gone. And, and I realized I was kind of a shell putting the, I know I know how to go through the motions and check boxes. I, I'm a pro at that. But it, it really hurt me all of a sudden. I realized like, like my kids only have one opportunity and I'm, I'm squandering it now. So anyways, when young, when they're young, they don't really feel that, that, that their dad's not really there, but as they get older, they can realize like your dad, you know, you're not, you're not present right now. So what I started to realize is I have to check that. And, and what I've been doing recently is recalibrating my expectations of life. Like what is a, what does a victory for today look like? Because see, when I was benchmarking a, being a dad or being, you know, the new occupation I had, when I was benchmarking that against jumping out of helicopters or airplanes or kicking down doors, like that was fun. But that was a short season of who Jordan was, right? Those are cool tools, uh, cool experiences. I can share those. I can give my leadership experience now with my kids and with my occupation, my business. But I had to recalibrate my mind on what the current victory for today would look like. The expectation had to be recalibrated. So now when I went to the zoo, it was like, hey, my mission today is to have fun with my family. So I focused on that. And the byproduct of that was, hey, I was present. Hey, I enjoyed looking at the, the, the giraffes with my kids and taking pictures and you know, it just changed the outcome of the situation, but it took me to do some training on, on expectations and recalibration of that. So let's go into that deeper as a dad to two foster kids that you're essentially giving them the second chance on family and proving the, that the early samples of the universe that they had were wrong and that they are capable of feeling love and being loved. Expand a little bit on what you do more of every day to try to make sure that you show up in their life in a way that maybe early in life they didn't get. Well, you think about when you wake up in the morning, just in general, pull the kids out of it. Like, what's your expectation for today? Are you just going to be blown with the wind or are you going to do your workout routine? Are you going to eat a breakfast? Like, are you, are you driven from a purpose or are you just waking up and just doing random stuff? So for me, it's, it's like thinking about scheduling the week out and not even physically all the time, but just thinking about like, Hey, today, I know I have to work. I know that uh, the weather is going to be decent. So I want to make sure I'm blocking out some time for the pool. And when I do this kind of this mental checklist of what should happen today, it gives me the, the block of time even for like when I'm at the pool, I know I'm going to spend time with my kids. I want to engage with my kids there. So it's just practical tools that I'm starting to put in place even. Um, but with that, it's it's the intentionality then. It, during this time, I know I'm going to be present with my kids. I'm actually going to tell myself that like self-talk because it helps me then identify what the expectations of today should look like. Otherwise, I always had this, I'm, I'm empty today and this is boring and I wasn't, I wasn't present because I wasn't calibrating where I should be today mentally first. I like that because we often, I know I felt it, especially in these past years where I've been trying to reboot my life, where just trying to find meaning outside of work, like, because from the moment I graduated high school and you could argue even in high school till January of 2020, I had a place to go every morning that was outside my control. And so without that, 
I had to just be like, I could, there was, I could have been lazy or I could did something and trying to rewire your mindset where you're the only one that suffers. If you don't do something, it's really difficult. And it took almost a good full year to get there. And now as the spring comes and the winter goes away here in Wisconsin, I just feel a more presence with what goes on around me. And even just this a simple idea of understanding that catch myself when I say there's not enough time today. Like that's my early warning indicator. Like that's the sirens going off. There's an air raid coming in my head of something's going to get ready to like, oh, I'm overwhelmed kind of feeling coming on. And I, when I recognize that, I pull back and think, okay, I have all the time in the world. Everybody has the same amount of time. And any time that I've just slowed down, know my routine, like you said, trust the routine, it's amazing what I can get done. Like laundry is a great example that feels like, man, there's 45 minutes of laundry up there. But if I just set this intention, right? And the kids got on the bus, I go upstairs, I get that laundry done. It takes 10 minutes. And it's always my version of it in my head that usually messes it up and just trusting and being present. And even just when the kids got on the bus, going for a ride and, hey, telling my daughter, like, hey, listen to the birds. Like there is so much that can come from just grounding yourself in the five senses you have that that can really help slow down time. And I know that there's kind of this oxymoron that I always like to say that we've never had more time in the history of the hum, hum, human beings, really, because you don't even have to go inside Target anymore. But yet more and more people say, I don't have time. And it's like, how much more time do you need? We don't do our own dishes. We don't do our own laundry. Like there are so many things that are automated. Like you can talk to your computer now. You can talk to your phone. You don't have to try to figure out directions, but yet we still have this falsehood that there's not enough time and so that's why I have that error rate siren, because that's my early indicator that I'm heading in a direction where the laws of the universe break down and I'm always heading into the dark places and I need to ground myself like there's as much time as I choose to make. I just have to make sure I stay present with not worrying about do I have enough time? Totally, totally agree with that. And even with business, you know, look at the Elon Musk's of the world. He's running like three, you know billion dollar companies put Even people Tony in Robinson, space he's got like 50 companies it, exactly and obviously they delegate a lot and there's a lot of trust and a lot of you know there's teams involved and i get that however at the same time in their own in their own right there's a ton of stuff going on 16 hour day minimum probably right and i think about what waste do i have in my life so when i say that you're like you said it's an early indicator of an air raid going on in your brain if you don't calibrate your expectations for what a successful day looks like backwards plan on what has to be done to make that that happens so then you block out time and you can realize where, where that waste is really at. Is it Facebook that I'm thumbing through? I get up for 30 minutes. That's 30 minutes. You never get back one. Did it actually help you fulfill your mission? Right. Are you, are you successful in your day by the activities that you do? And that's one thing people don't, I don't think of a mission statement for their life, for their days, for their families. And it, and it leaves you in this weird void because if you're always kind of just wandering, it's, it's really stressful because then you end up filling that void of time because you have no purpose with fluff time like facebook instagram and they're they aren't evil in themselves but they can they can become an, a machine that's that's harmful for your for your psyche for your family and ultimately it's a it's a robber of time TikTok, i find to be the biggest black hole out of them all like it really feels like time just 20 minutes goes by and you feel like i only feel like this thing is only i've been watching here like three videos it's like, it's crazy with TikTok. I truly feel like I almost, I'd stay away from it completely. I'm afraid to even go on there to even try to be an influencer because of how much time distorts itself when I'm on TikTok. TikTok. And I so agree of that intention and the planning. And there is a term that I learned from Navy SEALs called desired end state planning that they do within their mission planning of understanding where they want the end of the mission to look like, and then trying to backwards engineer and mitigate risk and do all these different things to that. And a lot of that is that. And if you do get feedback that you missed the mark or you failed on something today, all that is is feedback on what you can do better tomorrow. And that's the component that we know in the military and it's got lots of different names for it, but we need to apply it in life of that uh, reflect and review process that needs to be applied after the good day and the bad day. I'm sure that's what you run into where like, man, I missed the mark today. Well, okay, how could I mitigate that tomorrow to make sure that doesn't happen? Oh, a hundred percent. You know what the interesting thing is now? And I actually share this in my podcast, like a week ago or so, you know, my kid is in the bathroom. He's like, dad, I'm done. He's, you know, he's still young enough. I got to wipe his butt. So I walk over there and I heard a dink, 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 something fell in the toilet. We just got this glow in the dark marble set. And there's only a couple of glow in the dark ones. And I'm like, I'm going to flush that joker in the toilet. I'm no way I'm fishing that thing out. Right. And, uh, I see his puppy dog eyes. And I'm angry inside, like I'm frustrated, but I realize in this moment, because I've already set my day up, like, hey, I'm trying to teach patience right now. 
but I almost blew up at my kid for something stupid. So what I realized, I'm like, okay, I can teach him now. This is a learning opportunity. Grabbed some plastic gloves, went fishing for a minute, found that marble, whatever. And he probably didn't touch the marble ever again, for all I know. But at the end of the day, it was like, I had a decision to make in that moment. And it was a, it was a teaching opportunity. And so often, I think we, we don't look at life or, or single days as how do we get better? Because a week prior, I, I had a stupid outburst about something stupid and realized, man, how I missed the opportunity. I missed the mark. And it was frustrating. And historically, I ought to beat myself up and kind of got down and whatever. Now I'm like, okay, well, you're going to miss the mark. You're going to fail. But hey, it's AAR time. Let's talk about it. How do I get better? What tools do I need? Um, and, and I was fasting then. So there's other elements involved that were causing me to, you know, maybe be a little bit exasperating that problem. But it's I interesting. I love that teaching to the moment because my daughter just grabbed preschool last week. She graduated. And this week I've been noticing like these highs and lows of sadness, but she bring what she brings up as sad isn't really ever sad. Like today she was talking about how she missed mommy and she hasn't cried and missed mommy all year. And so me recognizing that I think she's really missing her teacher and the environment of preschool and now it's summer and her brother and sister are still in school. So it's just here during the day and just having the awareness and helping her process those feelings and not judging them, not letting my stuff get in the way of like getting mad at her and thinking like what she's bringing to me or her anger is one thing, but really it's another, like just being able to witness and help her process. Like that is where fatherhood takes place. And it's often those little micro moments, like fishing a marble out of a toilet where you create a moment of opportunity and you repeat that opportunity and moment. And that's where you create understanding. And I mean, there's two years later, my daughter will repeat something I've been saying for two years. And she's like, I finally get it. I'm like, okay, about time. I've been saying that for two years now. <laughs> and, and, and she's only nine. So I mean, I feel like that just kind of gives me that ability to like, you, sometimes you just need to keep repeating, showing up, not interacting with it in a way to bring in your own BS to the story. But just bring in your own teaching, your life, and just kind of reminding like that so often we just think of parenting as black and white punishment and it's got to be this or that. And it's like, that's not it. Like it's about give and take and it's about showing up. It's about loving even when they did eat the marble and dropped in the toilet and like all of that. Like they don't need you to be right or wrong in the moment. They just need love. Oh, a hundred percent. And you know, what's interesting as you talked, I, I was reminded of a story from one of my, uh, my pilot buddies I flew for 160th and. He was talking about this in, in the context of marriage and parenting. It's like when you're a pilot, you spend thousands and thousands of flight hours and, and landing a thousand times to get that landing perfect, right? And there's these, there's these, uh, there's curriculum, there's policy, there's all these different things to teach a guy how to do his job excellent, you know, to the nth degree. In parenting, I know there's a thousand books out there, but they're all subjective. They're kind of all circumstantial, you know, advice. Parenting is one of those things that it, it it ebbs and flows. And then as life happens, you have to be able to adapt to it. But how often do we actually, are we strategic with how we're parenting, how we're being a husband? Are we being the best version of ourselves? Are we trying every day the best we can and building upon the last day? Like, or are we just kind of going with life? And that's one thing I think we could all do a better job. And it's agnostic to background. This is not a veteran thing. This is across the board as fathers, as husbands, as business owners, as employees, what are we doing today to make ourselves the best parent we could be, the best husband we can be, the best employee we can be? And, and I don't know if we talk about that enough in society, in the men realm, probably. Oh, I would hardly agree we do not, because most of the time we're just like early on, we're waiting for someone else to do the work, we're waiting for someone else to own our shit, we're waiting for someone else to figure out why our life isn't the way we're at. Or we're just hiding. Like usually hiding is the default state because we don't feel comfortable being who we are. We're often maybe demasculated in that in this new modern environment of being something that you think you can be and for fear of upsetting someone. But it's that kind of that courage. And now what I've recently kind of put this all together as two words of just self-leadership. Like I've kind of, it's weird how I learned, like the Marine Corps talked about this stuff in different words, but they never called it self-leadership. And I wish they did because I would have learned it 15 years earlier. <laughs> <laughs> but this idea of how you lead yourself will be how you lead your life. And a lot of your inability to control or influence external things really begins. If you can't influence yourself, screw with everything else because nothing else will be as influenced as much as impact as you can until you can make the impact internally to know that you can do what you need to do, whether it be running or whether it be physically in shape or having the courage to say something, even wanting to say someone for a long time. Like that self-leadership is like a buzzword that I want to many men to hear deeply into their heart because that's where this journey begins. And 
you can't be a strong leader in your family if you can't be a strong leader internally to yourself. Totally agree. You know what the cool part about this conversation? I'm so intrigued about the future of guys like you because I believe most of the world's problems are gone. If we could actually have these conversations to build the family nucleus up, because so often we see these big problems in society, but they started small. They started the kitchen table or the lack thereof. Or the lack thereof the kitchen table. I told my daughter to take a, a survey at school once of, because it blew her mind that like what we do every day for dinner is something that's not common in America. And, and so so often we take that for granted, that opportunity. And, and my family is making it a priority now because we did slip away. It got easy to, and part of it is just kids are eating something else. I'm eating different kind of food. And by the time I'm done with theirs and cook mine, like they're already done. So it's not like we didn't have family time. It just wasn't intentional and the same time. And so I'm getting better at that. But to me, it's like, if we can have these conversations at a micro level and guys like you, they're doing podcasts to help these conversations, you know, get some scale behind them. To me, it's like, you, st- you take care of your home. The home takes care of the community, the community, the city, the city, the state, the state, the country. And it's an, it might sound like a lofty and unicorn dust goal, but, but how do we solve some of the big problems? It's not the government stepping in. It's us policing each other up. It's us taking care of our kids and our families and, and the communities that we, we live in. And I don't think this dialogue happens enough because we, we are reliant as a society on, on the government to take care of things. And every time the government steps in, typically it's bad. Typically they break it. It's not always a good result. So that's where I'm really intrigued about these kind of conversations collectively and globally. And it's interesting with Corona because there is almost, especially in America, there's a rejection of the government doing anything. There's like the people that are like, get out of my life. I'm tired of being told. But yet at the same time, those people that tell government get out of my life, they don't have control over their life. They want the government to step away, but then they're still not capable of understanding who they are. And I heard it said last year at a conference by Dr. Meg Meeker. She's like, if you want to solve America's problem, put a dad in every street corner because every kid is looking to be led by a father. And if it's not there, they're going to find a gang, a group of people, a teenagers that are not going to be the influence that you want them to be, but they're looking to be led. And it is that nucleus family that you talked about. And it is these conversations. Like I love podcasting because I often think of America as this fractured car windshield that isn't broken yet, but it's just a thousand tiny pieces. But with like a good car guy, they can put the resin in and bring it back together. Podcasting is that micro conversation to create these micro conversations to be that resin that starts to build it back up. And I'm more convinced than ever that like the power of a dad coming home to his family can change the world because if he starts changing his family, then he can start changing his neighborhood. Like I can't tell you how many times I go on a bike ride with eight kids and I only have three of them. Like I, like that's where I often like in the worst days, I'm like, okay, I'm just going to go outside and invite half the neighborhood to go on a bike ride. And there's kids knocking on my door asking to go on a bike ride. Like that's, what fatherhood leadership looks like today. And I'm perfectly fine with that. And that's exactly, it's as simple as that. And it's also can be as complicated as anything else you add to it. But knowing where you just start, like starting within yourself, your family, your neighborhood, like that's how you can change and make generational change. And that's why I love military dads because we live a rich life. We have so much wisdom and depth, but there are so many military dads that don't open up their stories to their kids. And to me, the worst case scenario is your kids are at your funeral. They hear from a friend of yours about a story that they knew about your dad and they hear it for the first time and they're like, why couldn't my dad tell me that story when he was alive? I would have loved to hear that story. And the best gift we can give our kids is for them to know us because if they know us, then our legacy, our lessons, all keep learning and can help our generation in the future. Like that's just really where I get excited because when a dad opens up, like he creates a possibility for a kid to understand how to make a bigger impact on the world from what his dad learned. Totally, totally agree. And and that's one thing you look at generation. There's different things that come with every generation. And that's where right now I'm excited to be millennial. Like I embrace that and I'm I'm gonna take it to the next level and I'm gonna I'm gonna make a mark on society and it starts with my kids. And you know, that's one thing being a foster parent. And I was a cop then. So I I literally would be a cop taking kids out of homes, handing them over to the CPS and the social workers, and then and I hour later, I'd get a text message or email saying, Hey, we need a foster parent to take this kid. And this is the situation. So working both sides of that spectrum gave me a lot of perception and depth of, of a lot of the problems that inner cities even see. And so like right now, you know, the whole, this last year has been very politically driven, you know, a lot of the BLM type stuff and the, the back and forth and who's at fault with what. And I'll say this, everybody's at fault. The whole system's broke. We can point fingers all you, all you want, but if you went into these inner cities and, and there's no parents parenting, and then they get, you know, a bad hand dealt to them from the beginning. Dad's not around. 
They are, they have a void in their heart. They're trying to fill. They meet the gang members on the corners because they're trying to fill that void for them because they know they know it's there. So they're using that to empower these kids to do bad things. Then they meet the resistance of the police and the police are the bad people. So it's the whole system is broke. So when we have these debates. It's like we're missing the entire boat. We've all lost already. Um, and that's one thing I'm saying now with my kids, like sharing things that my dad probably wouldn't share. And maybe they don't understand the full gamut of it yet, but I'll tell you what, they take nuggets away. So one example would be, you know, my kids are eight and nine and um, there was an outreach event that we did through a, a business network that I'm part of. Um, and it was to paint a, a homeless, homeless shelter. It's a veteran transition home. So it's something I believe in. I think it's a cool cause. It's a cool home and uh, it's new. It's up and coming. Um, they've got five, six beds, I think. And the idea is to vet veterans out there are homeless that they can actually potentially help get back on their feet, uh, gainfully employed, get to their medical, you know, medical appointments and help give them some foundations again and hopefully, you know, help them be successful. So anyways, I take my kids and we're over there painting and I get called to go and help with some IT stuff just based on my, you know, my, my background. I've now. been in that thing. Like, Hey, I'm, I'm a recovering <laughs> IT guy. What do you got for problems? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So it was, you know, there's five or so of us that went to go help and um, brought my kids and painting an eight, nine year old doesn't know is a good match. But one of the gentlemen that went with was phenomenal. And, he, and they, they all were, but one of which took and actually helped my kids paint. And the cool part was when we went home, they got to tell their friends, we got to help homeless veterans today. And, and that really broke me down. I'm like, you know, I, I almost didn't take them because I felt bad, but I would have robbed them of the opportunity to serve and what that meant for them. Like they were hey, you so have no proud idea how of that. that seed's going to shape them and what problems they think that they're uniquely solved. Like, to me, that's like, that's legacy. You're planting seeds in a garden. You might not ever see the seed grow. Or when you do, it's like, wow, that was, that took 25 years for that seed to fully mature. But you don't know until you just incorporate them into your life. And it's not about an or statement. It's about an and statement. Like, how do you be dad and incorporate everything that you are? And like, that's, that's a really powerful example there. It is. And I think life is full of those. And I think so often right now, because we're so busy, um, with things that don't really matter. They're not part of your mission. You're so busy with life and there's a lot of waste in your time. You miss those opportunities that are going to have the biggest impact and where you really want them to go. Like the end game is to be successful part of society. Hopefully land a good gig, hopefully be a good dad, hopefully be a good husband, all these or wife, whatever, all these good things. But then the opportunities we have to plant those seeds, we bypass because we're on Facebook. Oh, we want to get the next family trip in and family trips are important. They're fun, but they're not the end all either. There's, you know, a lot of things in life like serving that will do a lot more good for their psyche and their soul than, than maybe the next, you know, Disneyland trip that you're broke and you can't afford. Now you're fighting over money. Like what can we do in our, in our here and now today to leave that legacy and plant that seed for legacy? I absolutely love that. So Jordan, that's a great position to transition and wrap up our episode. So I want to ask you one final question out of all the wisdom you've accumulated from entering the foster system whether it be raising two boys and giving them a second chance on family, what is a piece of advice that you want to make sure every dad takes away from the lessons in the incubator that is your life? Uh, empathy is everything for me. And it starts there because that, that to me embodies like the idea of forgiveness and repentance. And, and a lot of these core fundamentals that I believe start a, a healthy relationship. So, you know, for instance, when, when someone wrongs me, someone in business or I get lied to or, or whatever, I can get angry and frustrated and upset and give them real estate in my mind and my spirit and, and rob me of joy and peace. Or I can understand that there's so many broken people out there that, you know, they like the idea of hurt people, hurt people and healthy people, help people. If I can take the posture of, you know, they're hurting and this is why they're out, you know, doing what they're doing and, and apply empathy and help be a good guide to help get them course corrected and whatnot. To me, I lead a lot fuller life, whether it's with my kids, because they're going to screw up. Guaranteed. That's their job. They're going to screw up. They're supposed to. But if I come at it like... They're, they're figuring out where the boundaries <laughs> are and where the walls are. They're going to mess up and touch the wrong stuff. Exactly. So for me, uh, empathy has been one of the biggest tools that I've kind of pulled from all the different vocations I've been part of, my college degree and everything else is like, there's a lot of book knowledge that I've gained too, but it all starts with empathy. If you don't have that, the other building blocks are going to end up tumbling anyhow. I love that you ended on empathy because when you can help understand what other person's feeling, then you, you add a richness to your life. And that would be a word that I would add to what you said about healthier and fulfilled. Like you would lead a richer life, not for monetary, 
but in the depth of what you're able to reach within your own soul, but then also able to help other people get within their soul. Like there's, I mean, I get feedback all the time. Like the way something I said helped someone understand something they've been trying for five years. And like that gives them access to something from the richness of my life. Like, as I've dug through my own story, like that becomes something that I'm able to help someone else with. Like that ability to empathize and feel what others are feeling is often what we're missing. But as a father, like, and I have two daughters. So like, for me, most of my responsibility with them is helping them interpret, understand and ground themselves through their storms of emotions. Like we just lost our cat a couple of weeks ago. And it's still like four weeks ago passed and she still sometimes cries at bedtime. And I just sit there and help her process what she's feeling like. I, it's not my job to judge. It's not my job to replace. It's not my job to shut her down. It's just my job to make her feel safe for what she needs to feel. And it will pass. And that's the idea with emotion. It should pass. It shouldn't be suppressed. Sure. No, that's, that's a great point. Well, Jordan, I really appreciated what you've brought today here on the episode. If people want to get in touch with you, is there any place that you would appreciate them and follow your podcast and what you're up to? Yeah, I mean, I'm on Facebook. Um, But yeah, uh, I have a podcast that I do with another fellow uh, Army Ranger. Um, It's called Driving Loaded. And the idea behind that podcast is just bringing a lot of military skill sets and what we've learned and help apply them to our, you know, now civilian life, trying to help each other become better versions of ourselves. Um, We don't have all the answers, but collectively in our communities, I think we do. And that's one cool thing about, you know, our podcast is we've had the opportunity kind of like this, interview people and just learn a ton. And the interesting part is if, if no one listens to it, I walk away a winner, you know? So it's kind of interesting. That di- is the cool part. It doesn't general. matter what anybody listens. It's just, it's a selfish exercise of your own <laughs> knowledge. And what I wish they'd also tell me one on the way out is every problem you have has already been solved. You just need to find the person that solved it and they'll help you. Like it's a crazy idea, but most people will help you if they've solved the problem already. So oh, you need for to know sure. more people. And a podcasting is a great way to just have more people and have more access to people that can solve problems that you don't know the answers to. And that's how the fastest people climb where they climb is because they were really great at finding the right person that solved the problem that they've been trying to figure out. Totally agree. Well, yeah, I appreciate you having me. This has been a blast. And we can catch up again. Thank you for listening to today's episode. That episode with Jordan Hillstrom was hopefully exactly what you needed to hear this week to get through to rethink about what you're doing and to think about how you can go through and be a better dad so my big takeaway for this episode is the part where he talks about believing new stories this is something within coaching that i work with many dads on where you're helping identify the current story that's going on in their head helping them understand where the narrative can go and where the narrative is kind of on repeat And the crazy part about believing new stories is you get to choose to believe a new story. Like it's only you that's really stopping it. And to me, that is something that many veterans don't really dive into. And we often don't really honor our ability to rewrite our own story. C.S. Lewis has a great quote that I repeat often that you can't go back and start a new beginning, but at any moment you can start and rewrite a new ending. And that is one thing that I believe Jordan did within his story. And that is something that many dads, especially military dads, where we have these stories of broken, this path of why did it all matter? These questions that don't have good answers. Rewrite those stories. And if you need help, reach out, reach out to me, reach out to a friend. These stories can be rewritten, but you have to understand how they're playing out. You have to even understand what narrative that story is telling yourself. Understanding where you want to go is as simple as rewriting your own story. Guys, have an amazing week, and I'll be back again with you on Friday.